Thank you. Um, we're going to show quite a few clips dur during this talk, and then there will be time for, for you to ask questions of Glenn at the end. Um, we're going to start with a clip of Everest, please. Thank you. Rob, talk to me. Pick up. I'm back. It's Doug Hansen. What do you do when you're not climbing, Doug? I deliver the mail. First mailman on Everest? Hope so. <laughs> I like that. I know there's a lot of mountaineering experience in this room. You wouldn't be here without it. But Everest is the most dangerous place on Earth. How's the weather? It's good. I wish I was with you. We'll all go climbing together next time. The three of us. What about your wife? Oh, she's been fine with it ever since we divorced. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, people! <laughs> if it isn't the mayor of base camp, yeah. sit down, man. Climatize. Human beings simply aren't built to function at the cruising altitude of a 747. Our bodies will be literally dying. So the game is, can we get you up to the top, down to the bottom, before that happens? This is suffering, man. A few more days, the rest of your life, you'll be a guy that got to the top of Everest. Yeah. Uh, Rob, where are you? I'm on the top of Everest, Helen. Yeah. Rob, pick up, mate. We got cloud coming up through the valley. It's a lot of it. Oh, no. We got people stranded up there and storm is getting worse. We got a problem. We're out of gas, Doug. Just go. No, I'm not leaving you behind. Come on. Ah! Ah! I don't want to Can you hear me? Rob? Ah! You've got to get moving. You can't. I love you. We, we were talking earlier about, we, we, we'll, we'll talk more generally about your career in, in, in a sec, but that so much of that was done in ADR. So much of the sound was done in ADR because it was impossible to record it yeah, in situ. For our, well, the great thing of a film like that, not good for everybody, but good for us is that we basically stripped the film back to nothing. And uh, so everything on the mountain, everything is revoiced. So probably about 95% of the film, apart from the bits, a couple of bits in the tent and the restaurants at the beginning, everything on the mountain was, was uh, redone because you couldn't hear, hear anything. It's an interesting story of that film, which I've never done it this way before. We started the film, and I was asked to do it by Bolt ages ago before they started shooting. But uh, they shot the film. They sort of got like a first cut together. And it was a mountain, your green screens, it was shot, it was shot in the Dolomites, Upper Everest, it was shot in Theatre 7, it was shot every, and it, was up, and it was a mess, sound-wise. I mean, you couldn't hear any of the dialogue. Oh, they, no. they got them the, so the first thing we did, we actually back ADR'd the whole film in about a week and a half with some of the access that we got. Sometimes some of the custom staff would do it. Sometimes we get some sound alikes and we'd do it, and they, we'd put that together. And then we did a rough sound design of the film in like a week and a bit, just some things. And we did it all in my place, actually. We got dressed up in the suits and walked around, got a bit of snow in and this, that, and that, just so that they, so that they can actually... You, actually... you actually got a bit of snow in? Yeah, we get snow in, yeah. At least we get by <laughs> snow in the metres, didn't you know? You just sort of put some bloke jones in a van and delivers it to you. So, uh, so we had all the kit. We got the kit in and everything. And so we, sort of like, we just sort of mocked it up like a play as quick as we could. And basically that was the stop, so that they could actually cut the film, because they couldn't cut the film because they couldn't hear it, they couldn't show it. They had to show it to sort of like, you know, there's producer screens, all these tunes. Obviously it's a film, it's like $50 million. You can't just show them something, they go <laughs> at an early stage. <laughs> so we'd done that at the beginning. <coughs> so that was their basically the cutting copy. So the cutting copy was sort of like a rough mix, done very quickly. Um, but in, and then obviously through the point of it, we had to create, the, do all the voices and everything. And the voice contact of it is quite interesting as well, because as they got higher and higher, they were 
getting more worn out, and we had to create that. So with the actors, so there's, we used to put these um, weightlifting belts on them and tighten them up. And, and more and more distressed they got, we'd tighten the belts more. And then they would have to be doing their ADR on the floor or run around the studios a hundred times and then tighten the belts up and then get back on the floor again. So that by the time, you, I don't know if any of you have seen the film, but by the time you get to the end, they're really in pain, they're really suffering, they can't talk, and, and they are really restricted. But to make that, because it's a true story, to get that journey to work, they had to go through that transitional point. And of course, all the original recordings that they're done when they're been out the mountains, they, you couldn't hear. So that was, that was sort of like a, a sound design in itself, that with the radio contact. Uh, how we did the film. I mean, there was an average, we used to start the film. This is, we haven't got to the sound design yet, but we used to start the film with original radio recordings of the actual event, which were unbelievably distressing and super cool. If you like sound, it sounded, oh, it sounded unbelievably amazing. So when we did the first major attempt of the film, I thought, right, we've got to make it sound like that. So we got it and we did all these distortions, this old stuff, and made it sound like these walkie talkies. And it was right, it was coming, it's going, it's Brilliant sounding, but you couldn't understand a word of the film. So, <laughs> so from the sound point, if you realise so, because you do it quite often with films, you try and be so authentic, you want to get, make it as real as possible you can. So you go to that point, that's why testing and doing this process is good. So then at that point, we had to pull back from it, and we actually took the radio parts out, although it's super cool, but it, it gave us a, a fantastic reference to how they were and, and, and how, how, the, how, they just, how the radios were causing some part of the confusion of what's up there because in that, in that period of time, you know, they're trying to talk with these masks on and information where they are, where they're not. So part of that in the sound is of trying to recreate that, but we did recreate it too good at one point then, <laughs> that we got <laughs> lost in the theatre, let alone up a mountain. So we went back. But a film like that also gives you, from our point of view, the, uh, uh, to make every single sound again. So that everything, in that, everything in that film, you know, from the helicopters, everything, because helicopters weren't real at the end either, you know what I mean? So we, uh, you make everything. So the great thing about that is anyone who's do sound, I don't, can't see anyone because I see, but who's doing this. When you have that opportunity, which I've been lucky to have in loads of times, is that you have control over every single sound element at any given time. And we, you know, doing a film like that, we mixed it in Dolby Atmos. We mixed it in uh, IMAX and the IMAX 12.0. Well, when, when you say we, how, how, how many of you? Well, not um, one. Eight of us, eight, eight okay. of us, something like that. My crew, but we, uh, yeah. So we, 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 we recorded winds everywhere. We had multiple winds that would on this particular film. We didn't want to create because you're on the mountain for so long. You know, we had to create base camp. Now, but we actually put uh, we in the create base camp. We researched all the stuff, and we got all these foreign voices, and we recorded them at distances and recording them, and then we used to play them on speakers and play them out and record them again to try and get the space, to get the, the, the space of, the, of, of, of that base camp and what it was. So when you hear the base camp then, we actually, everything you hear in that, we made again because some of it wasn't there, you know, and trying to create that vibe of it and that realness of it, which was all about that, even the prayer, you know, the flags and everything like that. We were trying to wait for a windy day at Pinewood, you know, in October. <laughs> we had some of these flags strewn up with mics everywhere, and it wasn't blowing, it wasn't blowing, so we were the cardboard and things like that to try and, but to try and get it how it was, you know, they really flutter, and you know. And uh, so we, had, we collected oh, thousands and thousands of different winds in all different frequencies and, and things like that. And, um, and we recorded uh, well, yeah, around Britain, recorded in, in Israel, and we recorded uh, in Greece and mountain tops and everything. And we've got well, we've got terabytes of sound anyway, so we've so we've got multi multiple layers of of the winds. But what we didn't want it to do was be just like you would watch a film, and you would hear it like an action movie. Hear it, you wanted to be within it. So rather than having a, I mean, you traditionally sort of like oh, wind would go through that sequence. With this film, we we didn't do that. We would we have we'd have some winds, and then every time. You know, he would turn, we would kind of change the frequencies. So there'd be multiple layers of them, so we had high frequency flow. So we had like, I don't know, three, four hundred layers of sound running at any one time in these big sequences. But we would always constantly move them. And we would try and put the actors in the film. So I don't know about you, but I always get inspiration, or like anything I do with my own experiences, you know, because I wasn't trained in it, I didn't go to college, I didn't do anything like that. So my whole concept of sound is about what I, my emotional content, where I've been, how I've felt things, and where, you know, how I felt at that time. 
So, like, you know, I remember walking my dogs windy days. You walk, and you got your, just, the dog's got nothing to do it, but I'm going out in the commons, and you walk. And you turn your head a little bit that way, and it changes. You come back, it changes, you know? You walk a bit, go past that tree, it changes. So that, the concept of this film, for me, is that every time they're moving and they're changing, we would change it all the time, which created us a lot more work because you had to have so much more material that you're moving through. And you also wanted to create that point of, of, of closeness. So when you get... And that, so you see a lot of it when they get up the mountain, you have all these sprays of ice coming, which obviously weren't there put on later. But I don't know if you remember, I can remember that, going back from, from uh, school when I was a kid when it used to snow a lot. And how you used to get, you have your parka on or what, and you get this, and you get the sound hitting you, and it'd be like tinsely, you know, like a little, it'd be that little metal hitting you. And you could hear it, and it would like resonate around you. So we set out to make these sprays, which was, uh, we, we must have shot them oh, uh, 12 t different times. Well, I don't mean just 12 takes, I mean like for hours each one. We would crush ice, we'd throw it across my ice, we'd catapult them from a distance, <laughs> we'd, uh, we'd get the film, we'd have the, all the, free, we'd freeze the ice, we'd freeze it, and then we'd have it at different times. We'd do sand, glass, flour, um, sugar, uh, all these sort of processes that we would chuck, and we'd have all these suits and everything, and we'd be thrown across and, and, all the, and an array of mics so that you'd hear the sound going, you know, you're trying to create a, a, a movement of them all. And I think when you, if you watch the film, there's moments that you, see, you can hear every tiny little bit of snow drop and, and, and spray hit the one side of the face. And the reason for that is because it's such a true story. We wanted to pray, you know, get, it, get it critically as right how they would be feeling so that you put yourself in a film like that. That was the idea. That, I mean, Bolt wants to be, we want to put you, you become part, you become on their journey. So when, when it gets tough and you're freezing, you feel cold in the theatre and you feel, you know... Ten, and when the power of the wind comes, it's like intense. I mean, because one of the, um, there's a scene when the storm comes, like a 20 minute sequence of the film. And that is when it already kicks off, there's a big journey. And the, uh, one of the, the climbers I heard was saying, it said, when the wind, when there's a storm comes in and it comes up the side of Eric's and it breaks, yeah, they feel it like a jet engine. It feels like it's, a, you know, like a massive jet coming overhead. If you see that sequence in a the theatre, the idea was that you would come up and it, we hear this thunder, and of course we mix in 53.3 channels, so it's all coming across from the back of it and everything, and it's all moving, and then it all, you know, like from a storm, it all quiets down, because it's very important in any film to have huge dynamics. You know, if you've got, you've got to leave something to go somewhere else all the time. So we've got it, and it closes down, and then all of a sudden you get this black crowd, and, and, you, and you feel this like massive power of the world, as it were, that were coming up and shoots over the top of you. And you see people, politically, when we played it in the, one of the previews, knocked back, and, <laughs> and these women were like, oh, going over the top of you. But that was the experience. It's supposed to be like um, the great thing today in cinema. You not only listen to a film, but you can experience the sound. You can feel the weight of the sound. So if it's raining, you feel wet? No, you feel, yeah, the idea is that you feel the power of the sound. Yeah. You feel, you know, like you, it's like, it's, if you get it right, I think you can actually... It's a force. The sound becomes a, an emotional force, not just a sound. And that's always my, my way of thinking about any film. It's not what it sounds like. It's always about what it makes me feel like. You and, know? And you mentioned that you had no formal training. No. So no how, well, I was how, rubbish at school, you see. So. And you were rubbish at school? Yeah, so... Um, rubbish well, no, well, rubbish well, teachers. I blame the teachers. No. But no, well, uh, I left very really early, so... But um, how did you get into... Well, Sounds I mean, like I was at school, but school wasn't, I was never really academic, but I did make, I mean, I was lucky, I made films at school, and I was good at woodwork and art. And my dad, you know, not what you know, uh, was in the industry. And uh, when I was like 13, 14, he used to be work on these shows, and he used to be one of the editors at ATV in the time. So he used to bring me home, the short ends from the film, Negative, which we would then go and shoot at school. And uh, then I'd give them to him, and he would go back to the set the next day when they're going down, give them to the camera guys. They'd give them to, they, with the rushes of that day, they'd give them to that. The next day, they'd come back in the rushes, they would give them my bit of film, up, the film would come back to me, and we'd make a film. So that was my sort of way in. And I, I mean, I got in when I was, so when I left school, I was actually working as stonemasons, uh, which when I, when I was from about 13 on the weekends and everything. And I was going to be a sort of stonemason. But then I had opportunities to go and work. Uh, it was actually for the BBC, and it was down the Gold Hawk Road. And uh, it was working on a kid's show called Words and Pictures, which I happened to, you know, it was a, it's a cool little kid's show. And the first thing I ever worked on was something called The Hungry Caterpillar. And, uh, <laughs> and then, 
and I, and I got to meet a guy called, which he was a quite, he had this radiophonics workshops, you know, back in there, and then Paddy Kingsland. And he would do all this really cool sound, which wasn't being really been done. He would be experimenting with different synthesizers and stuff that most people weren't. And I thought, so like, you're saying it wasn't very, it, there's no formality about it, it was just yeah. intuitive almost. Yeah, no, and I yeah. sort of like, I like what, well, you know, I thought that's pretty cool. And um, so I thought that's good. And then I remember I did this one, this next little show, there was about these two mice that could roller skate. So back at <laughs> Ealing Studios, we had the whole, I got, I don't know, I was like, I was 16, we had this whole studio. And so we got recorders then, and I, got, and I did all the roller skating there, you know, I'd roller skating around. And then at that other, so then I would go back to the cutter room and I was working as sort of assistant, like you, you know, I don't know, it's not quite the same these days, you sort of, I was a trainee assistant, you work your way through. And I cut all this, I cut all the roller skating and made these sequence out, and I thought, well, this is, this is all right, this is better than working. So um, basically went on and I got opportunities, worked on then, I worked on shows, then I, you know, I was lucky, I mean, I, I kept on working, I worked, I worked on loads of stuff, and, you know, from shows, TV, uh, rock videos with some of the first early, um, music videos, I used to be working on those with Duran Duran and The Stranglers and, you know, working with guys working all through a night, drinking whiskey and everything and all that <laughs> stuff. So, so my career's been quite varied, you know, and I, and I got into film, you know, I got, got into film, I can't remember. In fact, the first actually big feature film I'd done was Alice in Wonderland and, I was, and it was on, it wasn't on digital, it wasn't anything, it was literally, you know, you're 35 mil with a uh, China graph pencil, uh, Sellotape, Moviola. Have you ever seen a Moviola? They're like a beast, you can lose your hands in them and, and things like that. So I really learned from, you know, basically the technology, you had, it was about learning, knowing what you do with your sound. Your whole soundtrack was built in your head in those days. Because in the cartoon room, what you would do, you would go and you'd choose, you'd go to these places and choose your sound, you'd listen to them. You'd get them back and you'd log them and, and they'd be in boxes. And when you're working on your sound, you would be, you'd take a, that, I'm going to put that there, you'd have a chart. So you're making these sounds, and you can only play three at any given time, because you had a synchronizer, which you run by your fingers, to about 24 frames per second, to so that you could get the rhythm of it. And you had a movie earlier where you would throw the stuff in, and you'd sync it up, and you could play it. And then you'd flick it over. And you'd, and you'd gradually cut these pieces of sound, and you'd hang them up, and they would get put into rolls of sound, which were tracks. Um, so you would you'd have that in your head, and then you think, oh, what are we going to put that? And then that one will go on to that one, and that one will go on to that one. And you'd make it up, and you'd have to be listening. It was a great experience, because you really have to be figuring out what the sound was going to be in your head, because you couldn't play it. And you couldn't play it until you got to the theatre, you know. And then that was the only time that you actually heard all these, everything that you would do put together, because you didn't have it. You know, so about, then we moved on to, we had Steambeck's one. You know, this, I don't even know what Steambeck is. You had to motorise it, because it actually run at the right speed. Um, and you'd be cutting on those. And, and then it changed, you know. We went, then we done, we got the digital format came in, and now, you know, we can run, like, we sort of, it's changed in that respect. That, but I still think it's brilliant to understand the concept of, if you have a concept of sound, rather than just throwing sound at a film, have a concept of how you want to attack it, and, and, and sort of visualise it in your head is the best way to go anyone wants to do it, rather than just throwing sound at everything in a film. And just seeing what sticks. No, that's not good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I yeah. think you have to have a... I mean, my, that's my way. I'm not, I'm not saying that it's the, the right way, it's just the way that I do it, is that you... to You know, and I've learned that over the time, is, is A, not to be precious, you know, when you're making a film, and it's B, lose all your ego. I think I've not told you this. Get it out of the way. And uh, because so many times you can work and you can design all this stuff, you think, man, this is super cool. Look at this, I can do anything in the world. But the biggest thing you must never, ever, ever, ever forget is that, is that screen there, right? Because the story, everything is coming at you, you know? And a film is made up of some of all the parts. And, you know, you only got to look at the end of the end roller, see how many people are on it. So I think you have to respect, pay respect to the film and, what, what, and that's what you're choosing the style of the film. So you know why you're doing it. And sound in a film, even every, what, what, what is the most important thing that you would be hearing at that particular time? The dialogue, look at their eyes, look at the colour, look at... You, you know what I mean? So the sound should relate to all those things. And me being a sound design supervisor, so I'm sort of in charge of the, of the thing. Luckily, you know, and I sit banging when we get to the end in the middle and work with the director and everything like that. You're not thinking about what you've done. You've done it. Right, you know you've done, you've got everything there. You should be you should be you should be thinking about from a sound perspective of it, or telling the right story. 
And not at any time should you really think you should get to pull yourself out of it, out, out your sound design, whatever, out, unless it's for a purposeful reason. Okay. Can, we, can we watch oh, a clip of gra Gravity and yeah, then we sure. can talk yeah. about exactly what you were just saying? Thank you. You won an Oscar for that. Mm. It's a fantastic piece of work. But you started... We're going to have to probably just ask a couple of questions per film because we've got quite a lot of clips oh, to get through. But um, You started off with a 45-minute pre-visualisation. Yeah. Um, t tell us briefly how, that, how, how you did that with, with Coron. Well, basically, we, before the film was shot, um, in 2010, I had a call from me saying we to do this film. Yeah, and um, I did have my reservations at the time because I'd heard rumours. But anyway, we... Went in and we said, he's got this previous. So, so I went to the cutting room and he showed me this one. We started to show me this film. And, it, and it's quite funny. So he showed, he showed me a tiny little bit of it at the beginning. And he stopped and he, because he's quite a cool dude. Is he? And uh, he said, Glenn, I went down and okay, we have a problem here. He says, it is. there is no sound in space. So what are you going to do? And uh, so I, I think I said, one of one of my words. Like, to, but I said, oh, no, let's do it through vibration. So he goes, right, this is them talk about a concept, right? So this is my first meeting. We met for now, we'd had a coffee, exchanged pleasantries, he shows me this, <coughs> and uh, bang, puts you right on the spot. What are you going to do, man? So um, I said, well, do it, vibration, what do you mean? I said, well, she's oh, check. in a suit, inside the suit, is air, yeah? Yeah. So I said, so air transmits through the suit, bang, in the day, you go through your ears, little fluffy bits inside, make a sound. And she goes, yeah, yeah, I said, and we do it through. Do it through, um, so everything comes through Sandra. So you make her the focal point of, you know, come through that, you'll hear through her, which you do through the film, right from the beginning. When it goes kind of <laughs> space, you hear her, you hear through the radius, but you hear her. We use her heartbeat, we use, and we use her touch to, to pull very, where, you're, where you're hearing the sounds. And when she's not over touching something or you're not hearing that, you don't hear it. So that, that was a concept right then. So the idea, now at this point in the film, George and Sandra hadn't even been shot, right? They weren't shot, they haven't shot a film. So they've been working for about eight months on this previous. This is how films that cost a lot of money get made. So that the previsualization was basically from that, from the beginning of the film up to the point, I don't know if everyone's seen it or not, but she goes in, she eventually gets in, she's in the fetal position, yeah? So we finished the film there. So basically the concept which we turned around quite quickly, which was using the sort of vibrations, we mocked up as quick as we could, and, and the spinning and the breathing and, and then the helmet, I mean, they weren't there. They were like actually sex dolls in these helmets. Well, they held their mouths open. It's quite funny if you see it. But they're flying around and around, you know. So, uh, and uh, she's stuck on the side like this. Oh, I like that. But it's, uh, <laughs> so it, basically the concept of the film, and we, we sort of mixed this. We mixed it for this previous, we mixed in 5.1. Um, and standard days of Alfonso, eight in the morning to four in the next morning. Oh and uh, so... <laughs> So we, we did this for about three or four days to get this, you know, because he's getting the concept of it, which was the best thing ever for a film like that, right? Because once you have, that's what I'm saying, once you have this thing to go with, you can run with it. Anyway, they did, they showed that to the studio. She, the next part of the film got greenlit. Uh, Sandra and, you know, and George came in and they were shot in these light fields, you know, you know on a set with nothing there, you know, so, uh, and... So they were, I was off the film for that point, and then we eventually came back and we had to do it. But when we started to do the film, we went and recorded everything through uh, contact mics and things like that. I've got, NAF, I've got a bit of a space suit at home. You know, it's amazing. <laughs> this is what people don't know you do. You want to do something. You say, well, I don't know enough about it, really. So one of my guys who worked for me says, I'm like, I was at a party, my uncle, and this bloke was, used to work for NASA. So I said, let's get his number. He's got his number. He, he got hold of NASA. And saying I'm doing, I wasn't allowed to say what we we're doing. I said I was doing this film, and I'm, I want to, want, I want the right stuff. It's quite good. So anyway, they got this package back. Come, it's got from, you know, oh, it's cool. There's a bit of a spacesuit in it, and there's all these tools that they've got. And so I said, I said, can I find? So I find them. I said, well, you got these tools, you know, these space, these tools, whoop, whoop, stuff. I said, where do you? you know, there's not many, not many spaceships around happened and so uh, we went so <laughs> I thought where are they and he said well they do it in the motor trade yeah so the motor trade and medical I thought great one of my mates was uh, director of um, General Motors not you know, so I said yeah, you've got all these robots and all this stuff all these big tools and everything you've got in there can you get us in 
So I said, OK. So we went up to General Motors in Luton, and we went out there for a day, and we and went in their test area of all these talk. The reason we do these tools is because these tools are so accurate, you know, like for doing these spaceships and be accurate. And it's the same when they're making cars. Cause, and so, like, so we went in there, and we, we, got, we stuck our mics on everything we could for the day. And um, so we, we recorded all these through the contact, which record not through air, but through vibration, you know. So I thought we'd be true to this. We'd, I mean, so that's the first touch. So we went there, and I recorded every single tool, every bit, every bit of mechanical thing. They've got these robots, you know, you see on the dancing robots and that. Part of those arms are made from some of those. Um, and so, so but we can't stop, uh, you know, they cost like £35,000 a minute to stop this production line Do you, for you to put on these, because they're in cages, you know, because they're dangerous. Anyway, so we... Stop the production line. And uh, <laughs> they got in and we stuck all this stuff on because everyone thinks, oh, these boys are really making a film. It's cool, you get away with murder. So we stuck all these bits on and recorded these robots, you know. And so that was the beginning. And then and we, I went everywhere. There's a guy called Nicholas Becker. I, he, you know, he comes in, he's a French guy, he's mad. But he, he loves this. Um, <laughs> uh, he, he, I've worked for years, I did stuff on 28 days. 20, and we, we, you know, every time, I, and I go over to this place, there's a, another story that, I, so I go over to this place in, in Paris, and I rent this little studio, and it's like an aircraft hangar. So you can go there, and it's great. You can have red wine, cheese, whatever you want, you know. <laughs> but, and they, so I rent it out, and I rent it out, and I can have it as long as I want, 24 hours a day, whatever I want. So here it comes up, and we, we just experiment with, I've got this idea, this is what I want to do. So we recall through, you know, you've probably heard this before, but I recall through guitars, water, this, that, my, and everything that I could get this feel that we, the start of the film. So every finger actually has a different sound and, and movement, of, you know. So we recall thousands of these things, you know. So that's, it's, that's and, but it's, it's harking back, I had this premise of what we wanted to do, yeah. what we wanted to focus on, was in, in through her, contacting her through her breathing, her breath, her, her emotion and everything, like, to get to where you get to, you know. So you don't have to have all the other stuff, because it's, you know, we wanted to make it as clean, as, uh, a, as scientific to a point, but a movie that would play for, for the masses, so that it would be an exciting journey as well. But and it's like letting yourself go, you because know, once you have an idea, that idea, and you, it's amazing where it can go. You know, one thing leads to the next minute, and you know, the next thing, the next thing, and it's. Uh... And of course, I mean, we're, we're going to watch in a sec uh, uh, a clip of sunshine, which you you done with Danny Boyle. Yeah. A couple of years before Gravity, it'd be quite yeah. interesting to to see what you learned from from one from the other. If we can if we can watch this clip, please. So, so what, 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 how did you approach that? I mean, well, Dan, Danny's very hands-off as a director. Yeah, no, Danny's so, brilliant. I mean, I've worked for a long time, and um, he, we just have a, just that is, he just gives you, a, um, doesn't he? Doesn't tell you what to do ever. And right from when I did the beach and things, he never tells you anything. Apart from he has a vibe. You have a feel what we're going to do. You, do. you know what I mean? It's about I'm talking about feeling of a film. It's, it's we don't sit there. We don't spot the film. I know a lot of people might do it and go, you sit down and spot it. Now, I'm not very good at writing, so I don't like doing that. So we don't do well, that. What, what do you mean by that? Like people go through and they go, I want that there, I want that there, I want okay. that there. And I don't do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I can't do it. I hate it. Yeah, because it <laughs> narrows your field. You know, I, I'm so I've like, got to sleep when doing that. So it, it's, uh, you know, because for me, it stops your, what I do. And people in me because, you know, I want to express myself in their film. But as long as I understand, you have to understand your director. You don't want to go off on a tangent and give him something that you don't. You have to figure out what, that's what I'm saying, make this, what the film's going to be like, what we're going to do. And then obviously Sunshine, that's one of my favourite films, sound design films, we, because I think it's absolutely, not only that, it's a beautiful film. It is, I don't know if any of you have seen it, but it's such a beautiful film. And uh, it, so, you know, we, yeah, obviously we're in space, but we decided, because unlike gravity, like a lot of gravity was, was based in reality. You know, a lot of the scientific, a lot of its research and everything like that was reality, and we wanted for a sort of a true journey that could happen. Most of it is, it, it could work, you know, physics and everything we could work, you know, whether it would or not, I don't know, but it's, it could work. When in sunshine, obviously they're going to the sun to reignite the sun because our planet is dying. So we decided to do it in a different way and, and give things sounds. But we gave them sounds in a beautiful way. If you watch the film, we didn't sort of like rock it. We didn't do that. We sort of gave it a sense of beauty. And we were trying to create the sun. And um, also, one of the things, there's a journey that people get sort of die on the way and die off. And so part of it at the end, it's nearly like spiritual thing at the end. Like it's, 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 it's done it. You know what I mean? The spiritual thing, the sun. And you go. So each time one of the crew would die, 
we would take their voice. And so when the next one died, it would be part, wherever the sun would take someone else's died, it would be in there. You wouldn't hear it, but it'd be in there. We put it in this thing like, you know, Kima, you probably know these things. It's like, it's got a manual about that thick to, to, to read. And so I got some guys, well, I want to use this. It's pretty cool. So I had this idea and we played with it. And they said, kept doing this stuff and kept taking some, you know, taking bits out. It's like collecting down the market what you want, the right things, how it would work, you know. So each time, so gradually through the film, so when that, when that comes in at the end, everybody that's died somewhere is in that sun that envelops it. So they, 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 it's like, a, it's been worthwhile, right? Now, that may sound stupid, but it's like, I do that, it's a lot of films, like when the film we did 127 hours, I'll talk about it later, it was, there's certain things that you go to those degrees to, to get, so it becomes the sum of all the parts. But with, um, with Sunshine, Sunshine, Danny works, as you said, hugely with dynamics. We work on these films, if you've seen any of these films, even from 28 Days, that they're massively up there, and then we strip them out, and we go to dead silence, we're not scared of being... Like you, I think you were talking about earlier about distortion. People say, "Well, she's distorting, and this is breaking up." We go, "I love it." You know, there was that film there as this end sequence when he's coming <laughs> and Pimpy comes in. They have to do this QC on the film. You know, they send it off, and someone sits in a room, and they put their hands up. Oh dear, let's not pass that. Let's not pass that. <laughs> One of the reels come up. It's like I'm past rubbish. You know what I mean? Because it was all distortion, breaking up frequencies. But that's what it was. We were getting near the sun. It was radiation. It was breaking everything up around you. That's what it was. We love the sound of it. So you take these risks, and like with Alfonso, Danny, and when we work with the Chelsea's and that, take risks. But you take a, a calculated risk for a style of the film, and you and you and you don't just hit it halfway through the film or anything like that. You know what I mean? You're you're brave with your sound. You know, people often say, "Oh, I wish I could make a film like that." You do that, but you, in some direction you come in, and then they don't want to because they won't go to that degree. They won't commit themselves because they're oh my god someone's going to tell us off and we're not going to be able to do that but working with those directors they don't they, they are lost themselves it's yeah a, and i mean none, none more so than with 127 hours yeah. when when danny sold it to you as an action film which as we can see oh, did, now yeah, yeah. with the clip from 127 <laughs> hours it ain't that well th 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 that's you know the climax of the part but basically that portrays the way that we went with the film at the end of the day, the same thing. If you see the film, it's the same film if at the beginning when he gets caught, when it, the beginning of the film starts off, bang, 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 it's flashy, this, that, and then ride his bike, it's all normal, cool, sliding down, girls, the whole lot, right? Gets into the, comes down, cracks up, gets his arm. Then from that point onward, we close in on him, and the film takes place basically of his perception of what's going on in his head. And... Um, and obviously, the kind of moment in that sequence there, because I talked to Aaron Ralston as well, you know, and uh, I, yeah, I talked to him about it, I read book, talked to him about how he felt. And he okay, had, for those of you, sorry, but for those of you who don't know, it, this really happened. It's a true story, sorry, sorry, yeah. Sorry, sorry, that was a prosthetic arm, but it really happened. It really happened, so. he got caught and he was in there that day, and if he hadn't got out that, he would have died, because the reason he could do that, because his blood pressure had gone down, heart rate was low, but that's a medical part of it. But uh, <laughs> the concepts of when he hits his nerves and everything, he described it as like guitars being ripped from his guitar through these amplifiers, and this is what the sensation in his head that he was feeling. So that is why that when you get ah, that, all that, it makes it's because it's not just in one gore. The film is not film isn't about gore. It's about you know that, and it's about that particular sequence is. You know, it builds, it builds. It's about the momentum of him getting on. The sound design, that is not only that, it's about is how we stripped everything out at the beginning, using these breaths only, just, <coughs> and, and then using the music, and then using the knife, which, if you see the beginning of the film, is very pivotal to everything that sort of happens. So it is, it's well orchestrated, but it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and it's, it's for you, it's about an emotion, of it's about trying to make your heartbeat go, your heartbeat, about you pu pulling forward. So the sound design is about to make, making you push. You know, not just sitting back there and watching a movie like this, you know. You know, oh, yeah, another popcorn. You, you, you want to try and make this film so that you sort of, like, oh, you start feeling it, you know. And um, with that, that was quite quiet, actually, but uh, in the real film. But and with that, and then he gets to that point, and when he does that, you know, like, oh, you're feeling it, you're feeling is, it. Is that a gunshot? Oh, well, on the, when he breaks his yeah. arm. Well, basically, that is part of a gunshot, part of a cow's leg. In a vice, and uh, you didn't, and my assistant, yeah, crack. No, so uh, yeah, <laughs> no. There's no health and safety where you were. Never, no. It? Well, to you, you camera on, but you, but you have to do things outside <laughs> it, otherwise they would never let you do anything, you know. Okay. Um, and how do you work with the music? How do you work with the score? Well, because 
those two were so closely intertwined yeah, well, in that Yeah, well, you know, I mean, I work with the music guys, you know, on these films, and I know them, and we work together, well, they send it, we have it down, we design and work. It's not like, you know, I think it's different. Some people tell me, when some tell you something, you'll go then, it all happens in one time. You know, with us, it, it sort of doesn't. You know, we get some, a lot of the score, we get the music, and, it, do you know, it's, you've got to work together. You've got to work together with the dialogue. I mean, I love working with, with, the, with, with, the, with composers, you know, like... Um, when they send stuff down, I send it back with gravity. I mean, some of them, the music's got my sound design in the music. We said we sent it to him, he put it in the music, vice versa. It doesn't matter, because you're making, that's what I said, it's making the film. And um, on this one, you know, with the AR Rahman, isn't it, you know? And uh, we'd work with him on Slumped on Millionaire. And uh, we get everything. And I think I'll tell you extra, and it's very interesting from composer work. We were actually working the theatre with the raw tracks of his music. Right, so he does it, he'll go, Danny will go every night and they play layers and layers and layers of stuff like that and we get the score, we get all this music that he's done normally, and it does, it'll go to somewhere like Abbey Road or one of the Angel and, and they would mix it, you know, so we mix it all down. And we did that, but the thing with Danny, what he loves, he loves the rawness and he loves the passion of, uh, and the integrity of what, the, what it was like before it was all fluffed up and, you know, EQ'd out and all this stuff. So I can mean even from from that point we work with so we have control over everything in a way, and uh, we do have complete control. And Danny loves to work like that, and every composer ever works with him, and I'm sure now Daniel Pemberton's just finished. We'll be feeling this out the same way that you 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 embrace what this film's going to be, and if you've ever seen the films that he's made before, you know what they're going to be, and you're util utilizing the music and the sound and the dialogue, or stripping whatever you want out for the purpose of trying to keep that emotion of where you want to be at that time. And in work on those films, you want to be right... You, I mean, they're so dynamic, a lot of them. You want to push, you push, you push to the limits and then go back down again. And uh, so that it, it's, the, the sound is on on that scene. It is a combination of everything within going up, down, up, down, and, and but, having its place. But we also kind of wary of not pushing... Oh, can you push a scene like that too far? Yeah, love to. Yeah, I mean, basically... <laughs> <laughs> do you know... <laughs> I'm no professor, right? So basically what we do in the theatre, yeah, this is it, this is a blow my whole myth now, is that, you know, <laughs> how on earth do you know when you've got it to the limit if you don't break it? That's my motto, right? So if you want to go to the degrees of anything, you keep pushing, we keep pushing, you know, like, bang, bang, until you go, and then you go around, and I go, no, like, man, you know, we've, and so you know, so it's the point. On certain films, certain films you never ever get to that. Like most films, you never actually get to purple, you know. But but there's moments you don't want to, you know, you don't want to hurt people. You don't want to hurt that. But there's ways of getting louder and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger within what the scene's telling you. But you also say it's about what you leave out. Oh, absolutely. Like yeah. in that sequence, you know, we don't have we don't have all the gore. You don't see because it wasn't about that. You know, you see it, but you don't have that. <laughs> horror film stuff, you, you know what I mean? You have the knife and you have his breathing, you have the music, and then you have... But that makes it worse. Of course it does, yeah. but it makes it more, it makes it more of what he's feeling. Yeah. You know, it's that's what I'm visceral. saying. A lot of guys are going, yeah, I'll be a blood here, get that out there, you know, and stuff. <laughs> and it, it wouldn't have been a good, it actually go, oh, that's not as good. Yeah. So that's by being brave, leaving bits out. I've always said, it's not what you put in, it's what you leave out of a film. And um, what makes it really cool, because you, you know, at any given time, you say should be, what is the best thing to tell the story? And what do you want to feel? So that's where you've got to be brave with sound design and, you know, and, and following the, the concept through to get to where you get to. And then that, we took his point of view, and, and obviously there, there's a sequence before that and that actually gets to the point where he breaks his arm, which makes that break in if you see the, the sequence running up to it. I mean, if I did a talk in Los Angeles and that, oh, well, yeah, that sequence nearly killed me when you did that. And I said, well, Isolated by itself, it's you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a sound. But to make that sound the sound, it's, it's what ha the journey you get to. So if you want to do something in sound design that is like ah, blowing people's minds, you have to figure out what's before it and what's after it. Yeah. Because otherwise, you're, you're never really going to you're going to nullify that area that you want to be the best thing. And sometimes it's a journey. It's about the time that you gradually come from nothing to, to get to that point where you get to it will enhance you because then you're feeling like this in your seat. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's like when we did 28 Days and you see people shuffling because all the sound was out and it's like, brand people feeling uncomfortable. It sounded really dirty and gritty and they're like, oh my God, this is horrible, you know? But that was exactly the reason what we wanted people to feel because it was a horrible, you know, it was like dirty. It looked dirty, you know? So, you know, you have to figure a way of what you feel. Like I said about how it makes you feel and then use those tools, 
within the theatre and within everything that you have, and today we have a lot more than we ever used to, 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 to sell the story, rather than just putting as much sound that, you know, sometimes one sound, in, in one great sound in the film at that sequence is all you need. Yeah. It tells you that moment or that look or whatever it is. You go, Whack! and people, I can remember a little story, and Pockets, I'll tell you this story, that we were doing the film called The Beach, right? And uh, this is Danny, and we, did, we got, at the end, Leonardo gets shoved against the post and he gets this gun, with the gun click and he goes in and he, oh, he doesn't get killed. And they said, oh, you man. ruined that, that film. Yeah, film, well. yeah. <laughs> so I can remember, this is like, so I'm doing it every time, and Danny goes, oh, no, it's not right, that gun click. I'm going, Jesus, man, so I go away. You know, click a gun, ship another gun, make another gun up, make it out, whatever. And he goes, yeah, the one in, was it Apocalypse Now or, or um, one of those ones? You know when they buy the river, not Apocalypse Now, it's the um, Deer, Hunter. Deer Hunter. So they're doing around there and they pick this gun. So I thought, right. Now another man, my, uh, Terry Rollins, who's fam famous there, this old there, so he cut Alien in you know, all these films. And I know he had this laser disc player, right? And I knew he had this film. So I went around and I said, can you go, go down there? I want to clip this part. I want to clip that gun thing, right? So I went down there and I took the day, I clicked, clicked this gun. I got this gun click. And it was, it's obviously in the film, it's in, I can sight. Took it, so I'm going to attempt, stick it in there. Comes up. And he says, what are you done? What's, what's it? It's worse than the last one. It's okay, so I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I said, that's the one you keep telling me is great. So... Uh, I said, it's how we get to the point. It's like, I yeah. said, if you watch that film, this goes round and round, and it's really tense, isn't it? It's really, really tense. And so it's a release. The gun set is not so much the sound of the gun, it's the release of the sound and how you got to that point that made that gun amazing, you know? And it's also how you perceive things in your memory, that that moment made you feel like that. You think, oh, that was some amazing sound, you know? And it was a great sound, don't get me wrong, but it, it, it was everything, it's the story, it's how you got to that point that made that sound so amazing. And that's what you've got to look at. Let's, that's a good time to, to, to show a clip from Slumdog. Sorry, it's a bit of a Danny Boyle <laughs> I mean, loving <laughs> today. So everything changes for the boys yeah, in, 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 in that scene. Yeah, in fact, when it went on, it changed the game because the music took over. So that film was in that, that sequence. And originally, when, when we got it, yeah, I, when the score came in, it scored from the train, scored all the way through to that, you know, and, and the sequence goes on, his mum's killed. And we've, oh, that's, that's, yeah, we got, so we got rid of the, the music, and uh, and we decided that the boy, the, the boy became a pivotal point. Otherwise, it would just be violence all the way through. And obviously, you have the trains, you have the trains, and then we put a, and we created an ominousity of the train in the background, and then you start to filter sort of things. But because the sequence is, it, it sort of goes. It's basically the transition of the kids to where they, you know, they became orphans, you know, with their mum. So we decided to go. This is the sound design. But go with that. It's sort of normal. They're clicking. The cow comes. We got rid of all the music, and the, the boys are playing. So when they come down, we filter it. Obviously, that you know, down into it, and it's quite dynamic. The, 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 and it's very violent. So and then he comes out, and he's still. But the idea is that he's got water in his ears. You know, like you coming out of the bath. You know, like that. And then, and everything around him and his mother becomes more emotionally content because he can't even hear what's going on. Probably she shows him she can't hear it. Now that wasn't in script, that wasn't anything. This is what we, we did when we were doing it. So that becomes a moment, you know, and that moment becomes more powerful because he's not in it all clearly. He's, and he's confused. He's not only confused because he can't hear. He's got, it's all happening around him. And he sees his mum get killed, you know, and then, so then the next stage of it, his mum gets killed back, she went, and then there's a right, right kicks in, and it's all realistic again. And we play that, so then there's the riot, everyone's going, man, the boys are trying to skate with this, and then they see this sort of like godlike figure, and you can see the next bit, and then poof, the music comes on, and then they become a chase. So that sequence, rather than it just being a, a sheer amount of violence, it has so many dynamic ranges in it, and, and you, you, you flip the film into, into the boys' perspective of their mother in, 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 a, in an oral way as well as a visual way. And not only that, it makes it so much more cooler so, you know, for the film because it has all these dips and these different frequencies that you're going through. And, uh, and it changes again, you know. But um, that's, it's quite a cool sequence. That it was composed, you know, it was scored all the way through. And um, it was a different scene, you know. It, it, I'm not saying the music was bad, it was good, but it wasn't, it wasn't... It, it didn't have that urgency. It, it, didn't have that, it didn't have that shock and awe about these kids' mum visualising this whole thing that was happening. Because everything changes. Yeah, because they, yeah, everything changes. He comes out of the water and his life literally goes bang, bang, comes out of the water and his life is just about their lives. Uh, change, it just, they, that part of their life is gone. 
you know, and they're seeing it through a blur, you know, like you might do it in a visual thing, oh, go blurry, but we did it through that thing that, oh, they get the water in their ears and create even more confusion for them to make the, that sequence more confusing than it ever was before. And, uh, yeah, that's, that, I mean, they're the things that I'm sure everyone has, does is love doing because you get, you're moving all these same, you're using it all and stripping things out. Sometimes we don't have everything again. You just concentrate and then, bang, you bring everything back in again. So you, you have a great, it, it creates more excitement uh, and a journey for everybody watching the film. Yeah, I think. Yeah, no, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, it does. I think because we're slightly pushed for time, we're, we're, we'll probably just have to show this last clip of Ex Machina and then, oh, yeah, Machina. And, then yeah, cool. and, and then see if you guys have got questions. Yeah, no, um, that's a cool film. If you haven't seen that. It. Is a brilliant <laughs> film. Such a brilliant film. Um, how, how you? We were talking earlier about the the the, the, the creating the sound around Ava. The, yeah. The, the, well. The yeah. AI. The AI, yeah. I mean, there again, we, we, we try not to do that with anything that was... I mean, everything there is sort of made, we made from scratch and uh, trying to... I mean, interesting story, I think I told you with that story as well, that Alex didn't hear anything about Ava until... This is Alex Garland Alex who wrote Garland. directed. Yeah, he, was, he wrote The Beach as well, 28 Days and Red, and he's, he's brilliant, you know, he's very very cool guy, very clever. And uh, so... I had this idea we had to give her some sort of... Um, if you haven't seen the film... I oh, know you haven't seen it, my watch it, but he falls in love with this AI. So. Uh, but we had to give this... If she's obviously a robot, so she had to be a robot, but she had, I think she had to have a sexuality to her. She had to be something that there wasn't a barrier of... And all that. So we wanted to get away from all servos and, you know, all what robots are normally... You know, you associate with robots, you know. And um, so... You know, he gave free range, and he didn't. And literally, he didn't hear anything until about four days before we final mixed the film. Uh, and he, I can tell, I'll tell you, I made it later, but I can tell you what he did. So he came in, and I sat in my room, and I said, "Right," he said, "Let's have a watch this." So we watched basically that reel from the start to the end, and she walked past, and he sat there like that, and he went like that, <laughs> and he went like that, and I thought, "Oh." Jit, man. So they went like that, and it's, it's like it's a twenty-minute reel. And says, like, I don't have to swear it's going to be. But anyway, so so he goes, so he goes like that. And at the end, he's quiet. And he goes, that's a fucking mind fuck, man. He's going around. He sits back in his chair. He says, but oh, brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, I'm, and so I went, oh, thank God for that. So, um, but because he. It'd been quite a while. Now, this is cool, he said, because he didn't want to, you know, what can happen, you can get two attacks to things. Ava was gradually becoming what she is now, but she wasn't like that beginning, because obviously she's not see-through. So um, it, he wanted, so when they were cutting the film and we were even testing it, Ava didn't have any sound. She was just apart from her voice. So, and we were going to put it in, but we didn't, he didn't, he, you know, I said, I wanted it to be complete with a visual so that you had a... It was at Myers' moments that you wanted... I want him to have, and he wanted to have, an instant reaction to see if that... if the sound that we had worked on would take the film somewhere else again. So, sorry, so you worked... You did the sound when Alicia Vikander was as herself or as an AI? Well, it gradually knew it was oh, coming. Well, we didn't see it. I mean, that gradually came. It wasn't okay. as clear as it was now, but we're yeah, working. Yeah. So, it, 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 and he had this... You know, if that instant reaction, is this film on an emotional level, between them going to take... Because you get so used to something if you... Because this film is not like a normal... It's not like a robot film. If you haven't seen it, it's, it's a lot different than that. It's beautifully written. It's very intelligent. And uh, so we wanted something that it, it wouldn't get in the way of how he was feeling about her. It's about feel again. It's about how it makes you feel. So basically went around... So obviously, I went around sort of figuring out how we were going to create Ava in this way. So where did I go? So I got on a plane. So <laughs> I rented this studio <laughs> in Paris, and we got that. And I, we uh, bought in all these. I thought we'd do it with gyros, you know, and things like that. Things that weren't electrically pulsed, they had no power. So I'd spin them, and, whoosh, and we would shoot them. Got Nicholas in again, mad Frenchman, come in. And we put thousands of mics up, and we we uh, started off. Um, where did we start? We started off by doing it with the gyros and recording them like this and on wire and we had attaching you know, all these mics and we had 
normal mics. We had mics in water again. We had mics everywhere, stick on mics. And then it, we were doing it for, and it wasn't. I said, well, I want it through, I want it through oil. And he said, what do you mean wonderful oil in French? <laughs> wonderful oil. So he, uh, so he sent one of the guys out to get some oil. And uh, they came back, went to the garage, and they got some, whatever it was, Castrol or GTX. Uh, so they pour it in there. And he, goes, oh. and he said to me, he goes, I love you, you're mad. So we, we spin these, we got all these, yeah, it's amazing, you buy all these different gyros, you spin them up, you pull them, and they go on your arms and everything. But it wasn't really, they weren't, we got loads of recordings by now. So I said, um, and he's got to go, he's got to do it like this. So we did it, the last things we were doing is because make a mess everywhere. So we got these gyros and they, and they went, nothing. You know, it's like, it's going to work. Because I had this, I had this sound in my, in my head that this spin in this gyro would be a beautiful noise for a beautiful robot. So, you know, be soft, you know, like, yes, and it's this what I'm saying. It's not why I've, I had this perception in my head. And this is so we've done this and we got this. And it went, at one moment, after loads of it, we went, mm, oh, beautiful. So we, we, I, we go and look at all these takes, we've got Thomite, like, and we've got thousands of them. So what we, what we do, I go and I go, next moment, mm, oh, clip that, so just clip it. We'll take it out, stick it there, clip that. So everything we would have created, if I liked a little bit of it, because we'd recording them on like eight or nine mics, it'd be hours and hours, we'd record eight, 12 hours a day for three days constantly. With a, uh, you know, with a coffee and a wine break, you know, France. And a cheese. Break. So, uh, so we do that, and then we got the sound like that, and then we had these crystal bowls, right? And this this studio is a major studio, sort of like the uh, Bob Marley's been in there, and you know, all these rock uh, uh, Rolling Stones are recording in there, but it's you know, it's not Derek's in this, but it's a, it's just a bunker. So we're in there, but so it's got all this wood. It's a fantastic sounding room. So we've got this grand piano that's in this. So we do, we get these two crystal bowls. Uh, crystal bowls and you stick them on the piano like that and we're boing and they start wobbling and they're making this noise we're shooting it at a really high rate so that you can slow it down whatever you want to do and it goes on for hours and of course it's like perpetual motion I thought we'd discovered something in science here you know and it kept going and going and going and going and, going. and then if it's nearly finished now we're going to get something then it's speed up again because one would lean on the bigger one of the bigger bits of note ones you know the wires and it'll go again and at one moment in time, these, these crystal bowls sunk up. And he went, oh, what's that? So I, make, 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 I said, press the key there, man. Let's see what that is. So we'd finished. We got the recording. We stopped. And we go down there. And he go, oh, I love it. So now we've got, I thought, this is getting good. I like those two bits. <laughs> so we loop them up and start making this thing as we go. And then, for the, and that, and then we're done for all this other stuff. We, we got these things that span around. You put a little oil light underneath from them. It perpetuals, there's no motors, and it creates this weird noise as well. We don't know anything we can get hands on. And then this other weird thing, we had this, you know, tablecloth, uh, dry nut cloth, you know, this serrated bit, like uh, when you dry your dishes with, before dishwashers, you know what I mean? So we, we stuck it, we got a little table, and we pinned it around this table. Then we got a sharp knife, yeah? Then we got some buckets of water underneath, and we got some microphones on top, and we stuck them there, and we over the top, we record it, like we do everything. So we, and we had hydrophones, contact mics, all phones. And um, so that we get the vibration. One of the legs of the, of the uh, table was in the, was in the water. One was in the oil. And, uh, <laughs> so, so we wanted uh, like a serrated noise. So we got this, this, this knife going across the table, right? See, it's a real job, honest. So he's, he's sitting there. <laughs> he's going, rubbish. And the knife's getting stuck. Rubbish, man. It's, like, it's not going. In the, so we keep going and we listen back. And then we got one of these, the blades is caught at the right moment. And it, oh, what's that? And we went back, and one of the mites, I can't remember which one it was now, oh, it had this really, so we got, and then it made these rhythms up, which is in her stomach now, you know. So <laughs> <laughs> and so that, that was the concept. That's what I'm saying. You have a concept in your mind, doesn't matter how rubbish it sounds to anybody. You're going to get if you if you think there's going to be something out of it because you want it to be pure, you want it to be sec without any mechanical things to it, and it was just an idea. And I might have come away there, and we would have had to do another idea because you know. But can I we, can I interrupt? Oh, can yeah, I interrupt? We, we've literally got like three minutes. Um, can I just see if anyone's got any questions? Yeah, sure. you're, the thing is, you're too you're too brilliant a talker, and it's very difficult to. <laughs> Sorry, I can't see anybody. Has anyone got any questions? Um, I was wondering what your relationship with the re-recording mix is, uh, being a supervising sound editor mostly, and specifically on gravity, because um, I've heard Skip Leaf say talk, and he kind of 
comes across as the opposite of you. So what was your um, uh, working relationship with him and how did your different styles uh, I hated him. approach? Oh, okay. No, I didn't. No, no, no. <laughs> no. No. Well, he came out. And that, well, in, you know, I'm full on in the mix. I sit right in the middle. And I work really closely with the director. You know, so like part of my job is to direct the mix as well. Because I, you know, the, the, this is the end period. By that time, I've been on the film for 49 weeks. So I've been through hell and back with everything. And it, the great thing about when we got to Gravity with Alfonso, we've been through everything. We've done, we'd had our, you know, we'd had our falling outs. We got back together, kissed and made up, all done. We, so when we got to the mix, I mean, he said to me, this is great. The he said, this is great, you know, we got, um, we, we've designed the film, the sound is, we've done, we, we've done it, we're done. We're, we're done with the sound concept of making the, the sound design. That wasn't mean we didn't spend the next eight weeks carrying on doing it, but now what we were going to do, we had the music and we had the dialogue, right, so we had the sound, we'd already planned, we'd done all the stuff in it, so what we were going to play, and what we were going to play with was putting the film in a way that had never been done before, right in the moving, and every time we're moving everything. So most of the mix from, the music was different in a way, because it, it, it would sort of come on, we knew it, but we, kept, we had multiple layers. So what we would do, do with that, we would break down the layers. And sometimes, you know, Steve, and fantastic, as a mate of mine, he didn't come to the mix, he, was, he didn't want to see what we were doing with his music, but it was brilliant. And that music, not only that, is a story in that. It wasn't made, all the rhythms weren't made with drums or anything at all. So basically what we were doing was taking things and, and, and moving and working with the concepts of all the sounds and moving them around her all the time. So for my part, the mix was a lovely mix for me because, we, you know, we were, we'd, we'd been through that stage. We were happy with everything we'd got, you know. Obviously we changed bits and pieces when the music, because... Yeah, you do sometimes, so the new visual effects came in and you just wanted it bigger, especially at the end when, when it all crashes inside. But to a point of it, it was about moving and we would sit all together and I'd sit in the middle, Alfonso was sitting next to me there and uh, Skip was there and never there works for me, works in there and the effects, we, and we'd mix the effects. So we'd been on ages and uh, it was a fantastic team. You know, it was, it was um, a, a cool experience, you know, and we were trying to, because we were both so far ahead in, one aspect of the sound design on the film, we were able to experiment so much with the music and the, and the, and the movement of the film. Because not only that, the, the, sound, the design of the film is the movement as well. That's what I'm saying, it is the sum of all the parts. And not only to me, you wouldn't be going to be sitting there in the mix, yeah? So um, we had the music and we'd break it down. So sometimes we wanted to, one will go that way, one will go that way, and one will go that way. And uh, our funds would be sitting there and we'd go right there. And we'd have a lot of bit of paper, no, no, we, we go and no, he's over here, no, he's over there, no, he's over there. And it's like, where, where, where that? So that we're trying to completely follow the stories of, all the way through, put through the perspective of, of the character, you know, where, especially when George disappears around there and he, where's he gone? And he turns, he's gone over there. So, yeah, no, the mix, is, it was cool, but it didn't end there. Because luckily after that, we did the Dolby Atmos mix in it. We were going to always do a Dolby Atmos mix in it because I was on, under an NDA with Dolby, so I knew it was coming. And I wasn't allowed to say anything. So when we first started growing Gravity, I spent to, to them, I said, we're gonna, we're, I, I think if we, this comes at the right time, we, there's something blinding for this film. So we did it in 7-1, and then we went, and it's going to come out. So halfway through the mix, Dolby gave the white paper, you know, bah, that this system had come that we could mix in, you know, multi you know, mix in 53.3 channels, blah, blah, blah. So we, and, but we were really doing it like that anyway, but within the 7-1 environment, you know, because we were panning through 7-1 environments all the time, reversing it all the time. Anyway, because we wanted that, if you listen to film 7-1, it starts, does all that, but it can only obviously go from bomb, 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 right? We could expose the area. So we were lucky enough to get taken to LA for another 12 days in the next summer. So we went to 10 days and we took the 7-1 mixes. What we did from the sound design time, in my place, we uh, made all the objects and we converted into the Atmos in my room at, at, work, at Sound 24. Then we went to uh, uh, Warner Brothers 10, which is a fantastic stage around the Warner Brothers lot. Beautiful, you know, sunshine, stuff, cars, everything. So we sat there and we were able to really, really indulge in just taking that a little bit, you know, not one minute's overtime, but just use this system to the maximum we could use it together, you know what I mean? And it was absolutely, and by the time we finished, we all sat there and go, wow, you know, like people were coming and going, oh my God, you know, like if they hadn't heard this, 
before. Not only that, going over the head, and you know, anyone that mixes an Atmos or whatever, you, you, you be careful because you don't want to put everything every to be for at a time or you get it's it's like filling your bath up it just fills up and you become a porridge <laughs> in the middle that's what I'm saying it's about using it for the right reasons where if you want a transient sound you want to go through it and you feel it and it's for a reason then everyone goes wow yeah it's cool you know so but that was great so that film the mix was brilliant you know I mean I love the mix stage anyway because I love that interaction with the director you know we've got everything and it's good fun oh we've got to go I'm really sorry. I, don't know. I, don't know. I have no idea where that time went, and I'm really sorry that there wasn't time for, for, for more questions, but we've we got to stop, right? I think we've got to stop, but I've got a suggestion. Okay. You, what? you wind up? Okay, yes. No, I was going to suggest that um, if you want to hear more, come to the pub. I think we might have to set you up in the corner and have a sort of Jack and Ori story time <laughs> kind of set up. But... Um, yeah, I'm afraid we're out of time. We're going to get in trouble. It's all right. Um, I'm so sorry, Glenn. That's I think okay, we could yeah, all sit no here and thank, listen thank you, all thank night. You, Glenn, How great was that? Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Amy. <laughs>